whoever does not care about the affairs of others does not belong to that group. And therefore, anybody or any creation of God that is hurting anywhere is a mission for us to alleviate their suffering. Otherwise, what's the purpose for us here, right? And uh, God says, you know, oh, my servant, I was hungry and you did not feed me. And God sa and the servant goes, you are the almighty, you are the all-powerful, you are the feeder, you are, how could you get hungry, right? And oh, my servant, I was thirsty and you did not give me water, you did not give me drink. How could I give you water? You own all the waters in the universe. And that's uh, God asking and the that servant. Is, and that is, a, that is a saying in our Islamic theology. And oh, my servant, I was sick and you did not visit me. How could I visit you? How could you? And he said, didn't you know that my servant such and such was hungry? And if you had fed them, you would have found me with them. Didn't you know that my servant so and so was thirsty? And if you had offered them drink, you would have found me with them. Didn't you know that my servant such and such was sick and ill? And if you had visited them, you would have found me with them. So it's really important for us that we reach out to those who are oppressed because God is with the oppressed. And God will always, I shall come to your aid, even it may be after a while. And uh, if you look at most, whether it's uh, our prophet and master Jesus, peace be upon him, or our prophet Moses, uh, peace be upon him, uh, or even prophet Noah or Abraham or prophet Muhammad you will, you will not find them living in Howard County. Right? You will not find them living in the palace of the Pharaoh, even though Moses is started with the palace of the Pharaoh. Then he chose that I want to live with the people who are oppressed by the palace, right? That I am where I am most needed, not where I'm most comfortable. And I think people sometimes trade mission for comfort. That, oh, I'm comfortable here, I'm safe here, I'm secure here, therefore, this is a great spot. Right. I also think Muslims have have lost sight of what our principles and what really we emphasize. Uh, like halal and haram. Halal and haram is what is permissible and not permissible. That is around maybe, if you want to give our religion a percentage, that's about 10% of our religion, if you really want to think about it. But if you want to talk about character, if you want to talk about charity, if you want to talk about Everything that you have been talking about, yeah. that is 75 to 80 to 90 percent of our religion. And that is what God and Prophet Muhammad, peace be so upon him, nice. mostly talk about. Yeah. And it seems like we're so focused on, uh, I wanted to talk to you about this. It seems like we're so focused on making sure that our religion stays put, that we're forgetting to take care of those in our religion. For example, uh, God, when he sent down the Quran, it was the first time he ever promised that he will make sure religion doesn't change, that he will make sure a book doesn't change. He didn't promise the Christians or the Jews or anyone before that that. Correct. So the Christians and the Jews had to go out of their way to make sure their religion stayed put. Okay, cool. But with us, God said, I will make sure this doesn't change. So for some reason, when we move to America, we think it's our duty to make sure Islam is put, to make sure that Islam doesn't get whitewashed or washed away like Christianity is, and suddenly there's all these sanctions of Islam. It's like, this is not your job. That's God's job. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God is the one who told us he'll take care of that part. You're supposed to take care of the Muslims around you, take care of the Americans around you, take care of the African-American community and the Hispanic community. Yet we don't do that and we focus on, oh, I heard music in your background in that Snapchat. Oh, you, you don't have a beard. You don't understand. Why is that? How do we change that, Dr. Yunus? Um, so, uh, uh, so that's, that's, a, that's a really important point, which is uh, what we call the difference between ibadat and mu'amalat, right? The difference between uh, rituals and uh, character, right? right. Uh, if you actually look at the verses that deal with rituals in the Quran, they are actually less than 2%, like ritualistic verses. And even in the sayings of the Prophet, they're again the same thing. Uh, but when you look at how you treat each other, how do you uphold your own character, how do you, uh, you know, uh, there's actually a, a beautiful uh, a verse in the Quran which said, 
وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ وَمَا It means we, it suffices for all of your mission. So this thing, whatever is coming next, if you are able to satisfy that criteria, then your mission was completely successful. And if you don't, then your mission has failed. وَمَا is مَا كَافَ it, It's enough, right? It, it stops at that. So we have only sent you exclusively sent you as a mercy to all of our creation. Not to the Muslims, not to the people who pray, not to the people who are pious, not to the people who go to the mosque. He said to the creation, not even to only humans. To all of our the creation. The world. Exactly. To all the worlds. Which is weird that he used plural. 100%. Right. It's intentional. It's intentional. It's very intentional. And you look, I mean, he is, uh, you know, he came to be merciful to the animals and the plants and the environment. And, and you have all of these things where the Prophet basically is teaching us and telling us about these things. Uh, so if he satisfies that mission of mercy alone, alone, then he is successful in that mission, right? Um, it's really easy to focus on the rituals. And really, in reality, you know, your prayers, probably half an hour all day, all of your prayers, if you put them together. together Fasting, 30 to 45 minutes. One month out of the year, that's 11 months left. Hajj, you have to do it one week or two weeks, your whole lifetime, and that's it. Zakat, it's 2.5% of your residual wealth or of your net worth. What's Zakat? Charity, uh, it's right? It's a charity. It, okay. Well, it's, um, a ch uh, it, is, it is a charity. It's uh, more of almsgiving, really, rather than charity. Because charity is not obligatory, but zakat almsgiving is obligatory. So you have to give 2.5% of your residual wealth, not of your income, not, uh, you know, whatever, after you have done everything, whatever excess wealth you have, you give 2.5%. Um, but if you look at it, then the vast majority of your time, of your health, of your resources, what do you do with them? How do you spend them? How did you acquire them? And these are things that we always have to answer. So when we basically come and we are able to help somebody and we don't do that, how does that translate to our, to our understanding of what our job on earth is as vicegerents of God, right? The Prophet actually said, Meaning that if I were to walk to fulfill the need of one of my brothers, and Akhi, he didn't say actually believer or not, just anybody. If I were to fulfill the need of one person, it is more beloved to me than standing in seclusion in this mosque of mine for a whole month. So he's giving us aiding one person. Just one person is more beloved than a ritualistic deed for a whole month. For an entire, yeah, oh wow, yeah. And أحب الأعمال, uh, you know, أحب الناس إلى الله, the most beloved of people to Allah. You could say, well, the one who stays at the mosque all the time, or the one who reads the holy text all the time. That's that's logically maybe your answer. But the Prophet said, no, the most beloved of people to God is the one who is most benefit to the creation of God. And that's that that really we have to internalize that. We have to say, well, how can I be beloved to God? Well, God created this creation because he loves this creation. And you are the representative of God. So your job is to take care of this creation. Not to, uh, not to use it, not to abuse it, but to nurture it, to improve it, to empower it. And I think you, Im you implied something here that people may have not implied with you, which is that that verse, we have not sent you except as a mercy for all worlds, all beings. This is for everyone. Mm -hmm. Because when God sends down a verse to the prophet peace be upon him he's sending it to him specifically but then to the entire everyone all the time and so very specifically he's saying and if you it, we're going to take this again rather than putting the messenger we're going to put all of us instead right and if you we have only sent you everyone as a mercy on each other that's right that's right, <laughs> that's that's right. And actually, I mean, and this is something very crucial for all of us to recognize is when God talks to the messenger, the messenger is the representative, but he's representing all of us. All of humanity. Right? Yeah. And he is the role model. 
So you have to follow that role model. And he said, he said, indeed, you shall not attain faith until until you exercise mercy. And that exercise of mercy is an active proverb. It's not a passive proverb, right? It's not like, oh, okay. But you actually are compassionate. You're kind. You are, you are actively helping that person. And they said, oh, Prophet, we are all merciful. Like, we are all merciful. And he said, no, I'm not referring that you be merciful to the person that you like or to your friend. I'm saying that you have to be merciful to everyone who's around you. Right. right. It's very easy for me because I like you to be nice to you and to smile and to help and, you know, answer your phone call or this or that. But that's not what he's referring to. He's referring to actually anyone. Right. Especially those you don't like. Especially those you don't like. And as a matter of fact, um, one of the uh, one of the verses of the Quran, um, when Allah is talking about mm-hmm. and I'm just looking because I just this you know right here it just reminded me <laughs> right that they feed for the sake of God the orphan the needy and a captive of war who's a captive of war by definition he's an enemy he's an enemy right he was just released from jail. People who are released from jails in the United States, number one, there are so many people in the jails of the United States that are erroneously there, wrongfully there, should not be there. But this person was literally actively fighting against the Muslims, and he was captive, and he was released, but he has nowhere to go. So what happens? They feed them for the sake of God, and then they say, we don't want anything in return. We don't even need you to say thank you to us. We don't need you to acknowledge it. The only reason that we are doing it, that we feed you for the sake of God. When they have achieved that level of sincere care for the creation of God, they were honored to be mentioned in the verses of the book of God. Hmm. Now, those people have prayed all their life too, but God never mentioned their prayers. God never mentioned what they did in, you know, in their private homes with rituals. And I mean, we know their names. It's not that they are hidden from us, but God specifically mentioned that criteria for them to show us how beloved it is to him. To be merciful. And, it, and he says it over and over again in the Quran. And I want to ask you, so if that was the, if this is the mentality that you've been able to, to, to get in the United States, how did, how did that happen? Because a lot of Arabs and a lot of Muslims, when they move from their Arab country to the United States, especially as a refugee, they would like to hold on to everything, right? And focus on the rituals and not at all focus on the activism or the kindness or the mercy. So, so what helped you make sure that your mentality stays in the true Islamic sense? Uh, well, I, I only ask God to help me because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still, as they call, work in progress. So well, I'm uh, still... <laughs> UNFC, right? so, um, so I'm still, as they say, work in progress. And you probably have to ask my wife. She'll definitely say, oh, yeah, he's definitely work in progress. Uh, so one of the things uh, I think uh, is uh, we come from cultures uh, where there's not as much justice as you would hope. And there's not as much as social mobility as you would hope. Uh, And therefore, when people come to this United States of America, one of the things that they come for is opportunity. And America is a wonderful land of opportunity if you are qualified and skilled to do it. And Arabs and Muslims are actually disproportionately qualified because there's extra security and scrutiny for them to come to this country. So uh, an Arab or a Muslim who has made it to this country they are usually, usually some of your highest qualified immigrants to this country. They are doctors, engineers, high degrees, business people, very skilled to be accepted to get a visa, right? Versus somebody from a European descent, they probably could move to the United States much easier than somebody who is Palestinian or somebody who is Lebanese or, because intentionally our immigration system favors certain groups or certain countries over others. And, that's, and that is a fact. That's not a... a Muslim ban is 101. So, so that is... That, exactly. So that's, yeah. that's one of the things. Um, so they come here for opportunity and America gives them the world. And I think in the process, we have to recognize in acquiring the world, this world, we cannot forget the hereafter. And uh, by the way, I mean, we do have the impression that uh, I want to say something that is also factually correct. 
uh, Muslims happen to be of the most successful groups in this country, as far as financial goes. Uh, they also happen to be some of the most charitable of this country. So when you look at, you know, percentage of our wealth and this and that, and that has to do really because of our theology based on helping and charity and whatnot. Um, and we do that. But you are... I just want to, not to cut you off, I just want to also highlight that while we are the one, some of some of the highest income, we're also significantly some of the lowest income groups. And in we don't have a good middle class. And that's because, uh, yeah. The, so so that's, uh, so thank you for actually bringing that to my attention. Basically, immigrant Muslims happen to be some of the most successful Americans. Right. Well, Muslims Native here. Muslims, especially our black brothers who are Muslims and sisters, uh, unfortunately, they are still reeling from the days of uh, slavery, from the days of uh, oppression, from the days of, uh, you, you know. Don't e we don't even need to go back to slavery. We can just go right today. to Jim Crow segregation. Just today. 60, 70 years ago. And today, yes. You can go to, an immig to the immigrant uh, mosque in Howard County, which is a beautiful multi-million dollar building. And then you can go to a mosque in Baltimore that they cannot pay their electric bill. Like Al Haq Mosque. 100%. Right. Yeah. So, uh, and that, that discrepancy between the haves and the have-nots uh, is really exacerbated by an immigrant mindset versus, you know, an established mindset. Uh, initially, the Muslims who came here, they came for opportunity. They're like, okay, I'm going to work. I'm going to make it big. And I'm going to go back home. So they never belonged psychologically to the United States of America. That actually in the 1990s, 70s, 80s, 90s, a lot of the Muslims would send their charity probably to overseas causes, wherever they come from, Pakistan, India, wherever they are. But then this generation like yours, and to an extent mine, because I really came here for high school, we belong to America. There's no plan B. There's no country B for us. This is it. And therefore, now you start seeing the younger and younger Muslims belonging more and becoming more American and actually becoming more Muslim.